In the uh, 1930s, there was a, a man by the name of Ira Yates who was a sheep farmer in western Texas. Um, and like many in the 1930s, he was doing everything he could following the Great Depression to keep um, his family from, from being foreclosed on on his farm, from figuring out how to pay the bills, doing everything that he could in order just to, to make ends meet. Um, one day when he was uh, just sort of sitting out trying to do his best, um, he had people knock on his door who were from a local oil company, um, trying to convince him that he might have oil on his land and seeing if he would be willing to allow them to do some test drilling in order to explore the possibilities. And he was uh, uh, sort of instantly kind of resistant, not wanting to put his hope in, in the idea that there might be oil or this is somehow going to be this magical solution to his problems and that sort of thing, but sort of uh, grudgingly agreed at, at one point. Um, at about 1,200 feet below the land that Ira stood on every day, they discovered a, a massive oil reserve. In fact, the very first well that they placed on that land brought in 80,000 barrels of oil a day, and that was only the beginning. Um, future wells would bring in well over 125,000 barrels a day. Um, in the 1960s, they surveyed the land and said that there was enough oil to continue on for generations beyond them. And in the turn of the century, it remained one of the top 10 productive oil fields in the United States. And imagine for a moment being Ira Yates, in what's known as now as the Yates Oil Pool, standing on that land thinking, how am I going to pay these bills? How am I going to get by? How am I going to feed my family, and all along, you're standing on top of unimaginable wealth, unimaginable resources. I mean, not only was, did they become millionaires, over the course of the history, their family became billionaires as a result of, of all of this oil that was eventually discovered there. And the question becomes, was, was that always the case? I mean, before he knew, and you're just sort of getting by, he, he was barely paying the bills, but all along standing on top of, of an incredible reserve of natural resources. It's interesting to think about that, right? Like all along standing on top of somebody lacked the knowledge and he lacked the resources in order to tap into that. See, this morning we are beginning a new series entitled Built to Last a study of this letter that, that Paul wrote to the people in Ephesus. And one of Paul's fundamental purposes in writing this letter is to help the Christian understand what they have in Christ. He wants to help them understand who they are in Christ so that they live in the knowledge of all that is available to them because of Jesus. In a sense, Paul wants the, the Christians in Ephesus, he wants us to understand what we're standing on. Before we really dive into this letter, however, I want to I take just a few moments to kind, of, to kind of highlight a little bit about the background here surrounding Paul's kind of remarkable letter to, to the church in Ephesus. So in Acts chapter 9, Paul has this dramatic conversion experience with Jesus. He meets Jesus in this very personal way. And, and God calls him to be the voice piece or, or his chosen instrument to take the good news about Jesus, what we oftentimes refer to as, as the gospel, what Jesus offers us, to those outside of Israel. So much of the effort in the very initial stages of, of news getting out about Jesus was in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas in, in Israel and among the Jewish people. But Paul was chosen by God to take it outside of Israel. And so he goes on these, these series of, of sort of missionary journeys, we call them. And on his third missionary journey, Paul comes to a town called Ephesus on this third trip. Now I have a map here. Ephesus is, um, is a bit of a strategic location for Paul. This is at the time in Asia Minor on the very west edge of modern day Turkey. And Ephesus is an incredibly influential city. It's the fourth or fifth largest city in the world at this time. It is a port city, as you can see on the map, but in addition to that, it has 
four major, it's the intersection of four major kind of travel thoroughfares that go throughout Asia Minor. So as the message of the gospel, as that begins to take root, to be heard in Ephesus, it has the opportunity to spread and to spread quickly throughout the entire region. In fact, Paul, like, unlike most of his sort of missionary journeys, Paul would spend three of the, of the five years of this third trip of his, he spends three of them in Ephesus. He gets to know these people. He is invested in their lives and he loves them. By the way, if, if all of this sort of stuff interests you, this background stuff, if you look at Acts chapter 18, about halfway through the chapter, chapter 19 and 20, you'll hear Luke give an account of Paul's time in Ephesus and some of what's taking place here, and it'll help inform some of what we read uh, throughout this series. To make a, a long story short, Paul eventually ends up in Rome. Um, he is under house arrest as he wage trial for uh, um, against the Roman Empire and and he's, he's doing this he begins to write letters to various churches that he he visits and this is when he writes this letter that we're going to read to the people in Ephesus about 62 AD this this entire book this entire letter is is six chapters long it's it's 155 verses and it's it's takes maybe 15 to 20 minutes to read it out loud. It's a short letter, and yet it is this incredibly powerful presentation or understanding of the gospel and gospel implications in our lives. So what does the gospel produce in us? What does it do in our faith? How does it understand or frame or shape our identity? This is a big part of what Paul wants to get across. And in light of that identity, what, what is it? How does it look? How does it play out in our everyday lives? Matter of fact, if we were to sort of look for a simple kind of outline of, of Ephesians, you could break it down this way. You could say Ephesians chapter 1 through 3 really are about identity. Paul's going to spend um, the, his, the majority of his time focused on, on who you are in Jesus. In fact, most of the verbs in, fa- in chapter 1 through 3 are in the indicative tense, which means they're sort of positional. This is, this is what God has done for you and who you are in Him. But chapters four through six are much more sort of, if, if one through three are identity, four through six are activity. Okay, so in light of this, as a result of this, what does this mean? How do we live this out in our faith? And the verbs in, in chapter four through six are imperative. They're action verbs. Get, okay, so now act on this. W- do this. Follow this out. Live the Christian faith. This is the reason that I think Ephesus or the book of Ephesians is such an incredibly relevant letter to this day. It helps us understand the importance of this crazy thing called the church, of of what it means to be in the faith, to be rooted in identity that leads to action. And this is where we pick things up in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. We're going to read through the first 14 verses here today. So Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in verse 3, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get going here. I want you to hear this. The next rest of this section that I'm going to read in the, in the Greek language, the original Greek language, this is one sentence. Matter of fact, this is the long, so if you've ever gotten my emails and you think I have run on sentences, like, like Paul is on a roll here, okay? This is the longest sentence in, in the New Testament, but I, we can't possibly translate it this way. I say we, like I'm a part of the translating, like people who do that sort of thing, but, but you can kind of get the flow of what Paul is, is saying to the people. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chooses us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless in him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches 
of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things to the counsel of His will, so that you also, when you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of His glory. That's a good sentence, right? That is a full sentence. And these 14 verses that we just read, they're packed full of identity, of statements that Paul wants us to understand or how we see ourselves because of what Jesus has done. But before we dive into that, I want us to know, I want to just highlight this phrase that comes up multiple times where it says, in him or, or in Christ, said at the very beginning in verse 1, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. See, he's saying the second, being in Christ Jesus, affects how or who you are in Ephesus. The important part that we need to understand is, is how this informs our identity. What it means to be in Him means that we have been united with Christ. It means that we have responded to the gift of salvation that He offers us, that we've received His, his forgiveness, and that and that we've inherited the benefits of everything, all that he accomplished on the cross. To be in him is a legal and a relational term. It shows that what he's done, what he's accomplished is now ours if we are in him. So as we begin to look at these identity statements together, we can, be, we can hear this, we can receive this in one of a couple ways. If you are here this morning and you are a Christian, and you are in Him, then Paul is telling you that unequivocally, this is your identity. He's not saying this is inspirational. He's not saying this is something that you need to achieve. He's saying this is who you are. If you've trusted Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, you've placed your faith in them, this is your identity. If you're here this morning and you are not a Christian, Welcome, by the way. I'm very, very glad that you're here because we desperately try to be a church that not only is, is speaking this message to people who believe it and receive it, but also to those who are exploring and seeking to understand and, and a part of it. And so we're glad that you're here this morning, but I want you to hear these verses as, as an invitation. I want you to, to, hopefully this helps gain a better understanding of what Jesus offers and what you gain when you place your trust in Him. When you put your faith in Him. He's saying, this is what I will do for you. And this is what I want you to keep in mind as we begin to look at these three sort of identity statements that are so overtly placed here in these verses in, in Ephesians. And it begins by understanding that we've been chosen by God. We've been chosen by God. This is back in verse 4 through 6 and 11 and 12. Listen to this. He says, Even as He chooses us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestines us for adoptions as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace in which He has blessed us in the Beloved. Down in verse 11 and 12, it says, In Him we have attained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who were, first, who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. I think we can all sort of intuitively relate to the idea of, of being chosen, to either the, pain, or the pleasure of someone choosing us or the pain of feeling like we, we haven't been chosen. We all can sort of go back to some middle school memory where, where teams are being selected and people are being picked and either we were picked or we weren't or we were sort of the last guy standing, right? 
You remember that feeling. I remember being a middle school student. My small uh, church at the time, our, our high school students and our middle school students would often do things together because we didn't have a ton of kids. And, and we were doing this. My older brother, who's four years older than me, all, him and all his friends were kind of like the star athletes in the high school, more so his friends than my brother, I would say. But anyways, um, I hope he's not going to stream this online. Um, and, uh, and, and we were picking teams for like this youth group football game, kind of like on a retreat or something like that. And one of his friends, um, who was one of the star players on the, on the Eaton Eagles football team, was one of the team captains. So we're all lined up in that awkward situation. And, and I remember that with one of his very first picks, my brother's friend picked me. I think primarily to irritate my brother, uh, just as friends do. But I remember just the, like that sort of like moment, right? When you look around and you're kind of like, did he just, okay. You know, like this overwhelming joy that this guy that you sort of idolized as a middle school boy selected you to be on his team. Like your self-esteem just begins to like increase by like 20 fold just because you've been picked. You've been selected. You've been chosen. We understand the significance in our lives when we've been selected. Every, every daydream of a middle school boy, or at least when I was, had some version of being chosen. Like I was that guy that was just athletic enough to make the team, but not athletic enough to really be any good on the team. So I spent a lot of time sitting watching other people play basketball games kind of thing, you know? But you would daydream about the day when there was like three seconds left and the coach some reason walks past every other player on the team and grabs your arm and says, we need you to get out there and take this shot, right? Like that never happens. They never go that far down the bench. Like you daydreamed about when the prettiest girl in school, despite would just sort of walk by all the popular people and come over and, and want to um, go to the dance with you or something like that. Like that's what we dream about. We think about it all the time. So what does it mean for us to be chosen in Christ? First of all, I, I want to say here that, that I'm not going to do a deep sort of theological dig into the whole idea of, of predestination and election that are obviously all over these verses. They're present here and there's no denying that. Um, theologians throughout history, the greatest minds and, and some of the most godly people have debated how we are to understand the idea of, of being chosen and predestined and, and, and how do we think about that as the church and what does that mean and all of that sort of thing. In the scope of a 30-minute sermon, I, I'm not going to address that other than to say that, that God's choosing in correlation with man's responsibility seem to be both in this text. This is what J.I. Packer in his book, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, refers to as an antinomy. Antinomy. It says, J.I. Packer argues that the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man is an antinomy, and he defines antinomy as an appearance of a contradiction between conclusions which seem equally logical, reasonable, or necessary. It is neither dispensable nor comprehensible. It is unavoidable and insoluble. We did not invent it, and we cannot explain it. God orders and controls all things, human actions among them, and yet holds every man responsible for the choices he makes and the courses of action he pursues. To our infinite minds, it is inexplicable. So Packer points out that God's election his choosing of us as well as man's responsibility are both clearly taught in Scripture. We see them. It's God's design. And although it seems irreconcilable to us, in God's design and wisdom, they are both true. In fact, in that one sentence, 3 through 14, both are present where God's election is talked about multiple times. But in verse 13, it says, having believed the necessity of, of belief. They're both present. But what I, what I really want to emphasize together this morning is this reality. Where Paul's saying, if we are in Christ, then you have been chosen by God. Let me say that again. If you are in Christ, God 
chose you. In fact, in verse 5, it says that he predestined us for adoption. So, so the idea of being adopted means that we've received all the rights and all the privileges that come with being a son or daughter. In 44 BC, when Julius Caesar was assassinated, he stipulated in his will that his adopted son Octavius was going to be his heir to assume his role as, as Caesar. Like the people in Ephesus understood the significance of what it means to be adopted. And now Paul is telling them and us that you have been selected for adoption, but not by Caesar. By God himself, you've been picked. You have been selected to be his son or daughter to receive all the rights, all the privileges that come with it. And in addition to that, to be put on, on mission that God has set out to accomplish in this world. That you've been selected and picked and chosen in order to, to take up the family business. See, you are more than the son or daughter of a king. Saying you are the son or daughter of the king. Creator, this is what Paul is telling us. So once again, if you're here this morning and, and you're still in process, you're still thinking about what does it mean to be a Christian? What I want to be a Christian? What are they talking about? And you can hear something like this and you can say, well, does this mean that I'm not chosen? And I would say unequivocally, no, it doesn't mean that. Again, this is, this is an invitation to respond to God's choosing to become his son or daughter. This is why Jesus came. This is what he offers us. This is what we can all be in him. But beyond being chosen then, Paul goes on to say not only you're chosen, but you are a people who've been redeemed by the son. You've been chosen by God and you've been redeemed by the son. Again, this is Verse 7 through 9 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. Imagine for a moment that you had an absolutely unmanageable debt. Uh, some of us don't have to imagine that. Like we've been there, right? Like all the credit cards are maxed out and the mortgage is beyond what we could train and we owe our family some money and it's just accumulated to the point where it's like, what am I going to do? Like what am I going to do in this situation? And imagine that some sort of um, anonymous benefactor comes in in that moment and says, look, I've taken care of everything. I've taken care of everything. See, this helps us understand what it means to be redeemed, except for in this case, it's not an anonymous benefactor. We know exactly who it is. You see, Paul's writing to a culture that understood indentured servitude. They understood what it meant to have an unpaid debt that if it continued on long enough, it meant that you entered into a, someone's household as a slave, as an indentured servant, until that debt was paid. And as a result, they also knew what it meant to be redeemed. To have one come in and say, look, I've, I've paid the price for them. They knew that redemption meant freedom. And Paul writes in him, you have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses. In a separate letter to the church in Colossians, Paul says it this way. This is Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. He says, he's delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And there's two things I just want to really quickly point out here. First, I want us to see that this is written in the past tense. Our redemption isn't something that is in process. It isn't something that we're waiting for. He's saying, you have been redeemed. This has been accomplished for you, the debt, my debt created by my sin has been paid for in total, completely. Paul makes the point that, that this isn't something that we look forward to. This is something that's been accomplished. And it's not just me. It's not just my debt. 
It's yours as well. It's all of human history's debt. He's paid for it. Our redemption is an event that's already taken place. And so what a tragedy, what a tragedy it would be to be totally and completely redeemed, set free, and yet live as those under bondage. See, this is what Paul wants them to understand. Like, you've been redeemed. Don't live anymore like one who owes a debt that you can't pay. The second thing though, that I want to point out here is just the overwhelming generosity that is present in these verses. It's already acknowledged. We've already talked about the scale of the debt, but God's provision for that debt not only meets the need, but it does exceedingly more. It says that we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace which He lavished upon us. Like I, I, I love that word lavished here because this is more than just sort of wiping out the debt this is abundance this is superfluous supply of god's grace this is not only redemption and the provision of freedom but as we've already seen this is adoption into his home this is the transference of you and i from bondage into all the access all the provision that comes with being a son or daughter of the king he lavished it upon us this is why you and i we can't out sin god's grace this is why there's nothing so heinous nothing so so horrible in my past that god's grace can't answer that because we don't have that kind of supply god's riches of his grace has been lavished upon us so we when we are in christ we are chosen by god and we are redeemed by the Son. And then thirdly, I want us to note that we are sealed by the Spirit. Sealed by the Spirit. When Sherry and I were uh, just married for a few years, we were on, um, in Wheaton, living in Wheaton, and we were looking for our first home. And um, went out and kind of found a place, a little two-bedroom, one-bath, 900 square feet. It was a 1926 uh, um, craftsman style home. It was just perfect for us. Little thing, and Emma was just uh, born, and so we were ready to move in. We were out with our realtor, and we said, hey, we'd really like to make an offer on this home, and just drawing up the paperwork and says, well, do you have the earnest money? And I said, I don't know what the earnest money is. Like, I'd never heard of that. Nobody ever told me what that was. And she explained that we needed to write a check, a pretty sizable check, in order for the, the seller to know that we were serious about this offer, that we were serious about even buying the house. It was, it was kind of a guarantee, an agreement that we would follow through on the steps that we were gonna take. And I didn't have the earnest money at the time, so that was like a phone call to dad kind of situation in that moment. Like, um, but it was a seal, a guarantee that we would follow through on that offer that we were making. Look at verse 13 and 14 again. It says, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Look at the, look at the flow that is happening in these verses. It says, you've been chosen by God the Father. You've been redeemed by the Son, and now you are sealed by the, uh, the, the Spirit. See, this is, this is our assurance, our security, that we are in fact in Christ. When we put our faith in Him, we receive the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of our inheritance. A seal is, is a mark of ownership. It's of authenticity. So the Holy Spirit takes up residency in us as a sign that we have been chosen and redeemed. And the purpose is twofold. Because on the first hand, it is a sign to us, a reminder of our true identity. This is where we, we get our perspective and our confidence from as Christians. And there's a lot here that we could say about the role of the Holy Spirit, a lot that we could look at together. And we're actually going to get into that in a series following Easter. We're going to spend more time talking about the Holy Spirit and what He does, who He is in our lives. But for the purposes here today, I want you to think of the Holy Spirit as, as a wedding ring or like a wedding ring. 
this tangible reminder of a covenant. This thing that you carry with you everywhere that you go. How do you know that you've been chosen and redeemed? We know because God Himself and the person of the Holy Spirit has placed His seal of ownership on us. And it also then becomes a sign to others, right? As the Holy Spirit does His work in us, as He begins to produce what we call the fruit of the Holy Spirit, so He begins to grow these things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Those things begin to develop in our lives, then it becomes this outward indication of an inward reality. The people around us begin to see that we belong to Jesus. It begins to understand and to live according to the identity that Paul already says has been given to us. Paul's going to talk more about that later in this book. So I want to wrap up with this. All of you should have had one of these little three by five cards on your paper. I am a big, I am a huge believer in identity and the importance of understanding identity. And I want you to simply do real quickly to take this card and grab one of the pens in front of you. I just want you to write these three words on this card. Chosen, redeemed, and sealed. Chosen, redeemed, and sealed. And if you're a Christian here today, I want you to take this with you and I want you to put it someplace where you will have a tangible reminder of who God says you are. Like this has got to go somewhere on like a mirror that you see every morning. It's got to go somewhere on like a, the visor of your car. It's got to go somewhere where you will see it regularly as a reminder, a tangible reminder of who you are. And if you are here this morning and you are still exploring or you're still trying to understand what is this whole thing? I don't know if I want to be a part of this or if this is right for me. I want you to take this as an invitation. Like this is who God says he wants to make you. This is who you will be in Christ. When you begin to think about, okay, is this right for me? Is this who I want to be? This card, take it with you. I know this is a simple thing, but it is, if you will trust me on this, if you allow yourself to, to, to see this every day, to start your day by reminded that, okay, this is who God says I am. I'm chosen, I'm redeemed, I'm sealed. Start your day that way. It'll change the way you live. If you are one of our high school students or middle school students or elementary age kids, put this someplace that you will see it every day before you go to school. No, start your day before the first class, the first bell rings, start your day knowing this is who God says you are in Him. As Eric comes up to close us, I just want to remind you, that, that this is a physical invitation, a physical understanding of who God says, a tangible reminder that you are. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we, again, have the opportunity to meet with you, to be reminded of what you have accomplished on our behalf. Jesus, you, um, when we are in you, you change everything about us. Continue to do that work, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. As I offer this morning's benediction, I, I just want to remind you um, that we have a prayer team available that's here each and every week. People that, that love to come along say, like, we always like to talk about, like, we want to be a place where we don't have to pretend like everything's okay. Or if there's a reason to celebrate, to praise God, we'd love to pray alongside of you as that and well. Maybe you're here this morning. You've got more questions about what it means to place your faith in Jesus. We'd love to talk to you about that as well. So now receive this morning's benediction as we have that invitation. Go now in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who has shaped our identity, who calls us chosen, redeemed. May we be sealed by him. Amen.